I figured, though, I've done so much backstage work, uh, you know, on various productions. I knew lighting, I knew, you know, all kinds of stagecraft. Uh, I even knew the film and television world a small bit from what I'd observed. And I made the decision that I wasn't going to be an actor, that I was going to work on the other side of the camera. Right. I'd like to acknowledge that the episodes in this series are produced on the traditional unceded lands of the Coast Salish peoples, which includes the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. We thank them for allowing us to be their guests. Okay, so my, my story from the beginning. I was born in Edmonton because my father, uh, in the mid-30s, my father founded the theater department at the University of Alberta which is to this day still a very prestigious theater school. Yeah, big deal. Ran it out of a Quonset hut and, and uh, you know, what is now the studio theater. So um, when I was five, though, we left Edmonton and came out to Vancouver. And uh, my father, um, the early days of theater, he was, in, uh, he was one of the founders of the Arts Club, which is a precursor to the Arts Club Theatre. Right. It was basically just a bunch just of arts, arts type people hanging about, yeah. you know. Um, and he even started a small uh, theatre, which he tried to get going and failed. What was the name of it? <laughs> oh, I can't. It, it was just a um, like a shop front on uh, Seymour Street or Richard Street or something like that. Um, but he then did theatre productions um, at the Carisdale Community Center. And uh, Norman Young, I remember, was involved in that and they did Shakespeare there. You know, this is well before the, the, the Playhouse Theatre or anything like that. Yeah. So, essentially I grew up in, in Vancouver. But I had not only my father in theatre and um, my mother was a writer, was a scriptwriter, and and um, my father then started at CBC first as a script editor and then later as a radio producer. Right. So I had all of this background in the family, sure, and and kind of an itch to do something myself. So bless them, they built me a theater in the basement. <laughs> My mother sewed the curtains and, and there was like lights that, that came down. I, th I think they, they were like um, reflector lights, but um, they had uh, tin cans around them, you know, to, to focus the lights. Talk about the encouragement. Lights. That's great. That's yeah. terrific. Yeah. So, you know, that, that was awfully fun. And then I began um, auditioning mm -hmm. at CBC and uh, basically did a general audition. And in those days, there was not the opportunity for actors that there is now. And, and, and at that time, where was the CBC? Was it that old house down on Georgia Street? The, you know? the CBC, that was actually an old car showroom okay. on Georgia Street. Right. Um, and the, the height of it all was, was very limited. But, you know, a fun place, and the, the CBC back in those days did a lot more than they do now. Yeah. There was no such thing as independent production. Right. And so they did, out of that little studio, they did a series called Caribou Country that I got a small part in, a series called Friday Island, which is just like a, a half hour kid show, you know, on this fictitious fictitious place named Friday Island. The show was on Friday. Um, <laughs> my mother was doing a lot of script writing for a show called Hidden Pages, which was basically adapting uh, children's books uh, okay. into a half hour, half hour, maybe an hour um, show, all done in, the stu in that studio there. The turnover was, oh. was quite incredible. There were only four or five of us child actors in Vancouver. Right. So we got right. to do everything and knew everyone. There was a guy named Tom Hoff, I remember his Tom name. Tom Hoff, yeah. 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 Uh, and a few others whose names now yeah. escape me. But uh, that, that was a kind of a fun period. And then I got to do some stage stuff out at UBC. 
Right. Uh, which in those days... Like as a child. Yeah, as a child, pre-Freddie Wood Theatre, right. it was in the old auditorium, right. and um, uh, I did uh, Good Woman of Szechuan, I did um, uh, Winter's Tale, and John Brockington uh, was the director of one of those Donald Sewell, I want yeah, to yeah, say. Yeah, Donald Sewell. Uh, yeah. Except, so I was doing all of this and having a great time and obviously doing the stuff for the school productions and things like that. Yeah. The big change came for me when I when it came time for me to go to UBC. Right. And I just it was kind of assumed in our family because my parents had done you know, gone to university and you know, Cambridge and things like that, <laughs> that I would go to university. But I didn't know what I would do, and I assumed it would be something horrible, you know, like science or something like that. <laughs> in grade 12, STEM. In grade 12, there was a UBC catalog. I opened it up. There's a theater department. I don't have to work. <laughs> I could just right. take four years of theater. Yeah, yeah. That'll be a snap. Yeah. Well, it wasn't, wouldn't it have been as hard as physics or chemistry no, no, or something no, I like could that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, so university was good for me, and, and um, I, uh, I was in the radio society, so I got to learn to be a DJ and things like that. Uh, and of course, in the theater, I was in shows at the, the Freddie Wood and, and, and such. We did uh, As You Like It. As You Like It. And yeah. with Irene Prothero right. directing, right. who'd been um, a student of my father's at the University of Alberta. I wanted to get out of doing it because I was doing a show with Musak, and I didn't want to do it. So Musical I, Theater Society. Yeah, yeah. So I tried to do poorly in the audition, but because I was the son of her professor, she gave me a role anyway in it. <laughs> Nepotism, it, yeah. it bites you at the worst time. <laughs> That's it, yeah. Um, but um, I did get involved in Musok, um, and again, I, I did, um, West Side Story was the first show I did. Yeah. That's the first show I did. Yeah. yeah. It was a massage show. No, I was on crew. Yeah, I was on crew too. Yeah. yeah. That was a lot of fun. And and oddly enough, in, when I had joined, David Y.H. Louis was producing. Uh -huh. um, but then he graduated or that ended. And I went from Fly Gallery. I, th I think I was doing a theater in the park or theater under the stars show. At Malk and Bowl. At Malk and Bowl. Right. Uh, on the stage crew. We got a great opportunities for youth grant, which yes. Pierre Trudeau Wonderful. instigated. Of course, Wonderful. yes. Summer work in a field. And so we were paid to build the sets and then stage crew the shows. So that was BJ Clayton. Barb was involved in the right. shows then. Yeah. Greg Thompson. Rick Taylor, right. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all these wonderful people, yeah, yeah. and I guess I'm trying to think what it is I had done to deserve this. But a group of Musak people came to me uh, backstage, I guess at the time, and said, "Well, David Wyatt's Louis is gone. Would you produce our show next year?" And I said, "Sure." Yeah. And the next year's show was Fiddler on the Roof. Right. I came in and did the lights one day when the guy was sick. Yeah. After that. Yeah. I had never, <laughs> did, and, and his notes were just completely <laughs> uninformative. Well, I don't remember any, any particular performance being a disaster. So, so that must have, you you, must have been okay. You pulled it off. They had light, okay? They yeah. Light. <laughs> but that was a great cast. That was Richard Azunian yeah. um, playing Tavia. He did well. I saw that show. Yeah. I saw it as well as... Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Ruth Nichol, Jane Mortifee. He and Ruth together were fantastic. Merrick Norman. Merrick Norman. Yeah, yeah. He was in it there as well. Go. Yeah. And then Merrick and Richard went on to work together, collaborate, that they're still doing today. Yeah. Um, they wrote... Macbeth.
F the rock opera. Right. For those who for those who think the other. I actually think I saw that. I believe I saw that. It, it, yeah. it, was a, it was a great premise. It was, they built it around an American political convention. Right. Yeah. So it was the yeah. politics, yeah. the whole thing, probably play well today, you know, it given probably the American, really well today. Yeah. The American yeah. political climate. Yeah. Um, uh, and then we did uh, Tommy. I remember when Jeremy got, the, when the, or whenever the permission came through to do it, and Jeremy got the, uh, found out that all we had was the record. Yeah. And there was no clue that Tommy hadn't been done very much. I think we did the Canadian premiere, Tommy. Yeah, probably. You know, I mean, I like to think, and maybe, you know, being an old fart now, I go, oh, well, ours was the best generation, yeah. and we had this, and we had that. But yeah. I think even today, if you look at the people who are going through the theater department at UBC, Musok and all those other things, yeah. well, you guys, yeah. Taminus, Taminus yeah. Theater. Yeah. I mean, that was that was huge. Brent Carver. Brent Carver. You know, Bless I mean, soul. lots of folks. I mean, yeah, it was really, really a very fertile time. Yeah, you know, I gotta say. Yeah. And creative writing at the time was good because they had programs for documentary, radio documentary making, and things like that. I tried to get into that and I couldn't get into it. Yeah, I was able to do that course three times. Yeah, that was cool. Uh, with a, they gave me a different number. Yeah. Every time, you know, so on my record, I. Probably did, you know, short fiction writing and <laughs> all stuff that That's I didn't great. actually do. That's good. Yeah. 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 And, and at that point, though, being in theater at UBC was a turning point for me because I had come out of high school and the acting that I had done and I thought I was a pretty hotshot actor and, you know, whatever. And suddenly, in the theater department, in the acting class, there were 30 of me <laughs> who had all been the hotshots of their high school or whatever. I, I, I use that jokingly, but, you know, I would get all the lead roles sure. and things sure. like that, you know. So I had that confidence. And acting, as you well know, requires a lot of confidence. You have to lose yourself in your role and be confident in what you're doing. Yeah. And I lost confidence in that class because I looked around me and I thought, these guys are all so damn good. Wow. I'm not that good, <laughs> you know? Um, but there weren't a lot of opportunities. So I, would, I, I came to two conclusions. One, I'm not that good, uh, or I lost my confidence, one or the other. Um, and that I wasn't necessarily going to make a living as an actor. So I figured, though, I've done so much backstage work, uh, you know, on various productions. I knew lighting, I mean, you know, all kinds of stagecraft. Uh, I even knew the film and television world a small bit from what I'd observed. And I made the decision that I wasn't going to be an actor, that I was going to work on the other side of the camera. Right. And. Uh, that's what happened. And it worked out pretty well, I think. <laughs> it seems to have worked out. It's funny because if someone ever says to you, you know, how do you get into producing or how do you do, do this? I, it it's, has to be different for everybody because it, you take your own unique path based on, you know, your own little things that you can or can't do well and, and the opportunities that come up. And that's exactly what happened at UBC. I was... I had a summer job once um, as an all-night DJ at CKPG in Prince George. It was 1970, and even that was pure chance. I was in uh, the studios of UBC Radio in the summer. I dropped in, I can't remember why. The phone rang, the guy who answered it, it was the program director from CKPG. Hey, we need a summer replacement, can you recommend anyone? Right. Do you want to do this? And I said, oh, sure. So, there I went yeah. up there yeah. and um, met a guy, in fact, uh, named Denny O'Neill, who was in my, one of my uh, drama classes in high school, and he was now a DJ on yeah. that. So, I did that summer job. That was kind of fun. Yeah. And I was getting near to graduation from UBC, um, and, and 
not really knowing what I was going to do, I turned on the radio when Seafun was on, and here's Denny O'Neill on the radio. Right. Went over, rang the back doorbell, went in and chatted to him while he did his show. And I said, but do you, you have any work going here? And he says, actually, we need a production manager. You know, the guy who makes commercials. And he right. said, you know editing and things. Because through my father, uh, CBC radio producer, I was able to do some documentaries for CBC radio right. um, at the end of high school even and through university. So I had those production skills and I just went round to my profs and I said, I'm leaving a week early, if that's okay. You know, <laughs> yeah, I've right. got a job. And uh, so that's what happened. Yeah. I ended up uh, in working production in radio. Yeah. Um, and I did that for a few years, went to a couple of other stations doing that. Um, but got tired of that. You know, I, I, I was at, I think I took some time off and I went to London, uh, followed a girlfriend over there. Right. Um, and you're, you've got citizenship anyway, right? Yeah, you know, I'm a dual citizen. Because of your father. Yeah, my father. mother, yeah, yeah. born in England, my father was educated in, yeah. in yeah. the UK. But, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so I went over yeah. there, chased a girlfriend for a while and that fell apart. And came back, went to CHQM, which was kind of boring because the, the, they were like Muzak and, yeah, the, and the commercials kind of... were, were just a formula. Instead of yeah. having fun making commercials, it was one line of dialogue, bring in some sappy music and yeah. You know, yeah. whatever they were selling. Yeah. So I wanted out of there and it turned out, and that's the thing, it just, it's, you get the most unusual things out of nowhere that you least expect, but there was one of the announcers there had a gig doing voiceovers at BCTV. And he said to me one day, they need a sound guy out at BCTV. I'll recommend you if you like. <laughs> so there I went and did that for three years and then they needed a floor director. Well, I'd done stage management. Right. So I became a floor, a floor director. Yeah. And uh, now, floor director is that the job where the, the floor director's in a up in a up in a booth somewhere and you know, connected to all the cameras and telling people? Well, that, well that's the director up, that's up the in the director. booth. Floor the floor director's director, down on the floor. Headsets down on the floor, yeah. telling the talent and yeah. whatever, yeah. relaying the messages, making sure everything, right. you know, making sure the crew gets back from their break on yeah. time. I, don't, and, I, don't, I guess they don't do that much now anymore. Maybe talk shows. Well, you'd have to. They yeah. do, but but you would only see them on talk shows or yeah. You know, there, there's a floor director on news shows. Or on a sitcom, maybe. Because I yeah, and that's part of the problem. I ended up doing way too many news shifts with Tony Parsons, who's the nicest guy in the world, Norm Groman, yeah. etc. Uh, wonderful, but it's news, and that wasn't my background. Yeah. So again, I decided to take a leap. Had no uh, children at the time. Uh, this would be 1979. Right. Uh, again, the dual citizenship thing. I said, let's just go, I said to my wife, let's just go to England and I'll apply everywhere and we'll see what happens. So went over there and, and I can be um, very persistent when need be and, and <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, so I, I set up a whole, had a notebook with all of the people that I wanted to talk to and things like that. And uh, within three weeks, I got a job at the BBC. <laughs> Now the the job the, uh, their job title was assistant floor manager, but basically that translated to second AD uh -huh. on a film set. Uh -huh. So I then started working film productions. I did a great show called Shoestring with Trevor Eve, uh, that became quite well known over there. Yeah. Um, various various shows. So it was great. I was doing drama. It was BBC drama. You know, getting great experience, meeting but, a lot of people, and meeting yeah. a lot of people, yeah. and um, but the the pay 
especially at the BBC, is not that high. <laughs> it was considered a privilege to work for yes, the BBC. Right. Yes, they didn't have to pay you that much to be there. <laughs> and while there, my um, oldest son was born. So we decided we we maybe better, um, you know, come back to Vancouver, you know, and do something, earn a little more money and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, so I'm rambling on. You asked for no, my no, life no, struggles. Ramble, 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 ramble. It's great. It's oh, great. All right. So um, came back, and just as we were back, they were starting what really, in retrospect, was the first independent production company in Vancouver. And it was a company called Catalina Productions. Right. And they were that. they were based then in the. Um, North Shore Film Studios. Right. Uh, again, well it's ahead of its time. Panorama, right? Panorama. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Panorama. Which is now covered by condominiums. Exactly. That was really the only big, big, when I say big, it was big for the time, studio in the yeah. city. Yeah. And it was ahead of its time. Yeah. So much so that it was underutilized and, and therefore struggled. Yeah. Uh, the big show they did there was McCabe and Mrs. Miller. Yeah. Uh, that was shot there on the hillsides of North Vancouver. Yeah. So, what these guys did, Catalina Productions, was they turned their two sound stages, turned them into uh, uh, television studio space. Right. And uh, so they were hiring, and, and so I got on then as a floor director again. Uh, their their big show was let's make a deal. Let's make Monty Hall. Monty Hall. And they did uh, Tom Jones did a thing up there. Yeah, for a while. well, I, I, that was it was it only lasted a year. Yeah. Um, but we did two hundred episodes of Let's Make a Deal. Oh boy. Three a day, wow. cranking them out, wild, crazy audiences and things like that. But you know, it was it was, it was an experience. Yeah, yeah. And the fun one, yes, was the Tom Jones show. Because yeah. uh, we had all kinds of guests like Tina Turner and yeah. Marie and Donny Osmond yeah. and Isaac Hayes and oh, millions. And Jane yeah. Mortifee was very involved in that. She would sing if we had Tina Turner coming, but Tina would only fly in at a certain time. So um, so <laughs> Jane would do Tina in rehearsals. Right, yes. <laughs> uh, did a lot of background right. uh, singing. Yeah. Uh, Great singer. Yeah. Accurate. Accurate. Well, yeah, we had, there was, uh, one of the guests was Marissa Berenson, uh -huh. <clears throat> who could not really sing, right, um, and was off key. So Jane went in afterwards and, and overdubbed the voice, yeah. sounding just like Marissa Berenson, but on key. Yeah, well, there, you <laughs> there you go. I found out just the other day, Jim uh, Val Valance, Brian Adams, uh, songwriting partner right. played drums in the orchestra for wow. for Tom Jones wow. show. Wow. It's a small world. So yeah. that was fun, but then they, they managed to go bankrupt. Uh -huh. They 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 would not let others rent the studio. They were determined to do their own productions yeah. and that was a mistake because we were hired full time yeah. whether there was work or not. I did Iceman up there in nineteen eighty. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. And uh and I think I must have done something else up there, but I can't remember. Yeah. Because I knew the place. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so, yes, yeah, so they went bankrupt. Yeah. Owing us a little bit of money, but it wasn't the end of the world. And we all kind of made off with little bits of equipment. John Collins came to us one day. He said, Well, I got my thing, or whatever. And I said, well, What? He said, I got a fire extinguisher. <laughs> So, uh, all of a sudden, I didn't have a job, um, and, um, but, you know, I mean, they say it, I believe it, one door closes, another door opens, and, and I look at each one of these events, which any one of them could be quite devastating, and actually worked out well for me. So, yeah. I wrote to the BBC, and um, they, they said, oh, we'd be delighted to have you back, or we really liked you, and things. There was a thing about the BBC. 
we colonials did quite well because we have quite a lot of hustle and drive that a lot of the British crew did not have, so they seem to like us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> colonials. Yeah. Um, so, um, so I was going to go back, but um, I thought before I go, I'd like to make more connections at the CBC. Sure. There was a guy there, um, Bill Shrosko. <laughs> Every time I talked to him, it was always like, no, 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 we have nothing. He wasn't interested. But a new guy had come in named Joe Batista. Went to see Joe Batista. Ended up talking to him for like an hour and a half in his office. Well, this is crazy. And then he took me around and, in, and, and introduced me to all these people. Cool. And I thought, what's that all about? And then I found out that they needed a unit. Uh, manager, uh -huh. and I thought they would, you know, hire lower down and, and promote Bring whoever's up, whoever's up top. Um, and um, and so I thought, well, they may offer me that, but I will be interested. I've got the BBC thing anyway. So sure enough, I ended up going for uh, a board for a job interview. You know, five or six people in a room. Normally that would, you know, give me a bit of tension, like, you know, whatever. But I was going to the BBC and I didn't really care. Yeah, yeah, it was a very yeah. relaxed interview. Yeah. And uh, in the end, and I, and I knew that they needed somebody on beachcombers. Right. Um, and um, so, but I thought that they won't offer that to me. So I'll just do the interview. Now, it had been going on already. It had been... Oh, and the Beachcombers, yeah, yeah. uh, for anyone who doesn't know, ran for 19 years right. on the CBC. Began in 1972, I believe. Right. Uh, and this is now 1980, 1981, yeah. right. uh, when this happened. Right. Uh, so they've been going for 10 years. Yeah. They eventually ran for 19. So I'll be damned if they didn't offer me the beachcombers job. So I had to write the BBC and say, sorry, I'm not coming. Now I'm going to do this. Yeah. I'm going to do this. And I had a great three years doing it. It was a great crew of all kinds of Lots people. Lots of fun. Know. Lo yeah, yeah, nice people. Roy right. Lukow, yeah. DOP, and, and uh, Alex Pappas, the yeah. first yeah. AD, yeah. who's so good. And on and on and on. And on. Yeah. A lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and not too tough either. The, 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 they really got it down to a fine art. Our shooting days were eight or nine hours. Yeah, yeah. I did three of them and I remember they were all sort of just sail, sail right through. Not yeah, long. yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, it became a, Everybody was very chill. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had a fun three years doing that. Uh, but then... Um, uh, let me see, who am I going to blame? Um, <laughs> conservative Prime Minister. Um, Pick one. Joe yeah, no, I wanted to say Harper, but no, no. Uh, but then Brian Mulroney, uh, Prime Minister. And as the Conservatives are always trying to do, they cut the CBC's budget. So, um, so they let people go in reverse order of seniority. So, I was out, yeah. um, much to my chagrin, because I really, I really liked that show. So, I went to England then, and I just flew in, and I, 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 I didn't write, I think I wrote, I must have written a letter, but it wasn't one of those, you know, yeah, we want you back and we have a job for you or anything like that. Yeah. So I walked into the head of, walked into the head of the uh, drama department um, and, and she said to me, you know, if you'd been here yesterday, I would have said, I'm sorry, Nick, we don't have anything for you. But we're doing this new twice weekly show and we don't have anyone, we need an associate producer. And it's like, okay. Well, I guess. All right. <laughs> I, I said, okay, well, what is it? 
and I think at the time it was it was called East Eight or something like that, mm -hmm. and it was all to be shot on tape, which to me didn't appeal. I wanted to do the next Jewel of the Crown and you yeah, know, yeah, something yeah, like yeah, that, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. whatever. <clears throat> so, but I said, of course, I, I took the job, went home, flew everybody back, and right. you know, found a place to stay. The show ended up being EastEnders, uh, which became, in short order, the highest rated show on British television. We, uh, I was, worked on that show for two years, and during that period there was a particular show we did um, that we ran, it was on Christmas Eve, and had Christmas is huge for television in the UK. Yeah. So we secretly taped two shows for that day. One, the usual time at 7.30 with this huge cliffhanger. Right. Coming back at 10 o'clock the same night. <laughs> ITV was running blockbuster movies and things like that. We blew them off the map because as you left us at 7.30, Angie is pumping pills into her hand and drinking gin, and she's going to kill herself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that episode got 33.8 million viewers. Whoa, whoa. That's like half That's the population. Like half the population. Of the yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 wow. yeah. And I think uh, 10 o'clock had 33.1 oh, million. That's. Uh... And it okay. still stands today, as far as I know, as the highest rated ever, even above Charles and Diana's wedding and things like that. It, Man, was, that's, it was massive. So that's that was great fun. So, yeah, yeah. you know, going from a show I didn't necessarily. I guess want you went to, to the pub after that yeah. one. Didn't you? <laughs> but, you know, I didn't want to do this film drama, but it, it, it was a wonderful thing to work on because even though it's a soap, it's not like an American soap. They're, they're real stories, yeah. and you have to follow along to, to know what's, what's going on. Yeah. And for me, as now a novice producer, you have to be on your toes. You're doing two shows a week, 52 weeks a year. The scripts are coming through, you've got to be able to act fast, and the editing, and the whole process is, is very condensed. So that was great fun. And I did that for two years. But then I wanted to get off that treadmill because you, sure. never, you never had a rap party. No, no, there was <laughs> no time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not a rapper. <laughs> you know. um, so I then went on, I then switched over to uh, some miniseries, three parties is what they call them in the UK. Yeah. Uh, did a wonderful one called The Marksman, Jumping the Queue, another short series I did. And, and uh, then I got a call from um, a guy named Phil Redmond, who was doing um, a similar primetime soap for Channel 4 called Brookside. Same story with BBC. They don't, they don't pay you a lot of money, even though I was in a much elevated position. Mm -hmm. Basically, he wanted me to go to Brookside, which was shot in Liverpool. Right. And he doubled my salary to do it. So get on that train, buddy. Yeah, exactly. So and and um, unlike uh, East Enders, the first after the first season of East Enders, we were a million pounds under budget. We were trying desperately to to spend the money. We were buying production cars. We 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 went we decided we'd go shoot some episodes in Venice. <laughs> Because you can. Um, we you all run into that problem again, you call me. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and we hardly made a dent in that million pounds, yeah. but the department loved us because they were a million pounds over budget, so it worked out in the end. Brookside was shot with a much lower budget. So it was a similar thing two shows a, uh, a week but shot on a much lower budget and this taught me how to do that kind of right. production so that's what i did and and began to formulate the idea that maybe i'd like to create a show of my own um, mm -hmm. shoot it in similar low budget fashion or whatever um so 
thought of that, and what I discovered was because I was over producing in the UK with some highly rated shows, I suddenly had the attention of the CBC executives. Right. Yeah. You know, oh, come on over. He's We're actually good. Yeah. Yes, he, well, I don't know. I'm not saying I'm actually he, good. He left some. He yeah. left here, and he's but he's actually good. Yeah. I, I would correct something though. What you say, I never. I wouldn't have said. Oh no, I'm good. Uh huh. Um, it's very much where you are at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. Because. Um, the show that I developed became Northward. Uh -huh. The show that I did for the CBC back in 1990, which ran for four seasons, 90 to 94. Northward came out of my experiences on EastEnders, realizing what a large audience, a kid's audience, the show had. Uh -huh. I was on a summer holiday at a... At a place up north of England and they had cabins and things like that but they had a TV room and I wandered down to watch that night's episode of EastEnders nobody in the room it was about five minutes to go all of a sudden the doors flew open all these kids teenagers and that came in plopped down watched the show got up and left and I thought that's interesting so I looked at our show and realized that we had a lot of um, strong characters in their teen in their teen years uh -huh, sure. as part of EastEnders, and that resonated obviously in in the UK with audiences. So I thought, why not develop a show that was principally teenagers? And I was I was not here during the early Degrassi years. So I didn't, right. I didn't really know there was already one <laughs> being done, you know. So that's what I developed and pitched, and, and uh, Yvonne Fassan liked it and picked it up. And, and to speak to this thing about it, it's just circumstances at the time, uh -huh. I, I heard from somebody who had pitched a show pretty much the same as what we were doing with North, you know, well, essentially teenagers in high school, whatever. So he was really annoyed that, that mine got done and his didn't. And I realized the whole difference was my background at the time because I'd come from this to that to that. Sure, sure. Yeah, I got yeah. that opportunity yeah. where probably this guy's show would have been just as good as ours, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it's just luck, circumstances. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, a lot of it is subjective anyway. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, packed up, came back yeah. here, and uh, we did. Uh, we were blessed at the time. Fetzan had just come from NBC, and he gave us enough money to write ten scripts. Wow. Unheard of before and wow. since. We wrote ten scripts. Uh, of which we only, well, we almost didn't use any of them, but we shot two of them, and he allowed us to throw that away too, because I wanted to make some casting, a few casting changes, and tweak here and there. So, I mean, we only took those shows as far as Rough Cut, uh -huh. but that was enough to show us what worked and what didn't work. Right. And again, in Canadian television, that's unprecedented. No, no, so, no. That's, yeah, yeah, and exactly. Fetzan, at that time was was great was great for us yeah. um so did that show and a great cast lachlan monroe uh, yeah. was in it yeah. That's uh, right. like yeah. yeah um and um we did well we our ratings were over a million yeah. uh, which today is even better but yeah, yeah. back then was was very good and um didn't. The problem is, I was enjoying it too much to be doing what I should have done, and that's develop other shows while this one was going. Right. I was just riding along, and yeah. I thought this is this is fun. And uh, then there came a change of management at CBC, and um, I, the the writing seemed to be on the wall. Even though our ratings were good, the new management gave us a different day and a different time slot, which killed our audience. Yeah. Um, you know, the show was better than ever, but it killed our audience. Yeah.
But even then, I remember being out in Toronto and going to see Fitzsand, who in those days had just taken over CTV. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's funny, I'm here to see you today, Yvonne, because I think they're going to kill Northward. He said, why would they do that? He said, the show's doing great, it's popular, and all the rest. And I said, oh, I have a feeling. And sure enough, that's, that's what happened. Yeah. yeah. So, almost immediately, I thought I had another show going, um, working with Lynn Johnston, the cartoonist. Right. Uh, right. Who did the cartoon For Better or For Worse. Yeah. And originally, the concept was to actually bring that family to life. She, probably reasonably so, was reluctant to do that because she realized that a TV show could take it in one direction and the strip would want to go in another, you know. Yeah. You cast somebody great or whatever and their part becomes way more, you know, than, than what the strip would have done. But she said, but I have a great story. I knew the guy who animated... Um, the Charles Schultz cartoons, and he is a great story in himself because he's an old-fashioned guy, still hand draws and hand paints the cells and works out of this funky old building and that. So we developed a series called Drawn Together. Okay. Uh, which yeah. seemed to get a lot of traction. Um, and in fact, FX were just going on the air and, and they're all, oh, we love it, we love it, we love it. But yeah. I learned something with American networks. Um, we were going down quite often. I'd go down with Rick Drew, uh, my uh, writing partner at the time. And we'd go into meetings, and every meeting was, oh, love it, love it. They'd go, oh, love it, love it. Yeah, well, let's, let's do this sort of thing. And Rick and I would be in the elevator afterwards, high-fiving, you know. Yeah. Then they eventually say, no, maybe not. In Canada... They were, they, and it's still true today. They go, no, maybe not, maybe not. Oh, well, maybe, oh, okay, okay. yes. <laughs> so, a totally different thing. <laughs> Thank you.